In this video, we're going to do a deep dive into the vitamin choline. Choline is a really interesting nutrigenetics example, because it turns out that based on our genetics, some people need choline in their diet and some people do not. So why is that the case? And what does choline do anyways? We're going to talk about what choline is and how we make it, including some of the important genes. We're going to talk about what happens if you're deficient in choline and how that pathophysiology arises. We're then going to talk about the genetic basis that can underlie conditional essentiality of choline, and then use that to talk about genotype-dependent recommendation for choline intake. Phosphatidylcholine is the molecule choline attached to a phospholipid, but choline can exist in our bodies in several other forms. The roles of choline depends on what choline can turn into. One role of choline is it can be converted into the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Another role of choline is through its conversion from betaine into s adenomethionine In this case, it can act as a methyl donor. This is important for development, as methyl donors are important for many different developmental processes. A third role of choline is as phosphatidylcholine. Phosphatidylcholine is a really important phospholipid, especially for delivery of lipoprotein particles. Shown here on the right are some of the structures of choline and its derivatives. Choline, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, Betaine, which can then go on to become s adenomethionine glycerophosphatidylcholine, the head group, attached to either phosphatidylcholine or sphingomyelin with lipid tails. The loss of betaine means that you do not have sufficient substrate, s adenomethionine, for methylation reactions. Loss of phosphatidylcholine means you cannot generate lipoprotein particles. Loss of acetylcholine means you don't have the abundance of a particular neurotransmitter that you need. Therefore, the deficiency of choline can result in a whole spectrum of phenotypes that may seem unrelated. For example, Developmental defects can be traced back to the lack of methyl donors. Muscle weakness and anxiety is thought to be tracked back to the loss of acetylcholine. Fatty liver disease can be tracked back to the idea that you need phosphatidylcholine to transport lipids out of the liver to the rest of the body. If you don't have phosphatidylcholine, you are unable to package those lipids and they stay in the liver, resulting in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The adequate intakes for choline here are shown on the right. For adults, 550 milligrams per day for a man and 425 milligrams per day for a woman. This increases during both pregnancy and lactation. But the adequate intakes were only added to nutrition fact labels for choline in 2016. Furthermore, only about 11% of adults are thought to meet the adequate intake for choline. So this provides some controversy. If only 11% of people meet the adequate intake for choline, does that mean we're all choline deficient? Does that mean we all have the phenotypes I've talked about on the other slide? Well, no, not necessarily. It turns out about half the population needs to ingest choline from their diet, and the other half can make choline themselves. This has been tested several times, including by this particular study design. Shown here is a study where for 10 days people were given a baseline diet with sufficient amounts of choline. They were then randomized into a choline deficient diet, which involved depletion of choline for about six weeks. They were monitored for signs of choline deficiency, including liver fat and muscle breakdown. They were then refed choline to see if those phenotypes went away. It turned out some people had phenotypes associated with choline depletion and other people did not. The reason for that is there's some variation in humans in terms of choline biosynthesis. As I noted before, the major source of choline endogenous biosynthesis is by conversion of phosphatidylethanolamine to phosphatidylcholine through the enzyme PEMT. That's the major source of which we make choline ourselves. So if you're not getting dietary choline, you're dependent on the activity of PEMT to be able to generate sufficient choline. It turns out there's quite a few variants in PEMT. Shown here is a non-coding loss of function variant in PEMT. As you can see, this is actually quite common. It exists in about 40% in some populations, but is quite rare, being barely present in other populations, including East Asian and South Asian populations. So what would you predict would happen here? One hypothesis might be that people who had variants that resulted in loss of function in PEMT would be more susceptible to choline deficiency. That's exactly what they found. They found an astonishing 25-fold increased odds ratio for women with variants in PEMT to be responsive to choline deficiency. This included fatty liver disease and muscle weakness. Now, why was it stronger in women? Well, it turns out the polymorphism on the previous slide prevents the estrogen-induced transcription of PEMT. In men, there is no estrogen-induced transcription of PEMT, so that variant plays less of a role. There have since been other genes that have been associated with choline essentiality. This includes choline transporters, the choline dehydrogenase, and choline kinase. Variants in any of these can affect whether or not you are required to get choline in your diet, or whether you can make and use sufficient choline yourself. 
Why do you think choline deficiency resulted in liver fat accumulation in this study? And how could it be related to anxiety? And then I want you to take a step further. What would you recommend for how we set the adequate intake for choline if we knew everybody's genotype? Pause the video and ponder these questions. In summary, choline is a semi-essential micronutrient. What that means is it's essential for some people, about half the population in America, and dispensable for the other half. Some people are able to make sufficient amounts of choline through the enzyme PEMT, but half of people don't have effective PEMT and therefore must obtain choline from their diet. Insufficient choline intake, coupled with an inability to make choline yourself, can lead to anxiety, muscle weakness, fatty liver disease, and developmental challenges. Choline is a really interesting example of nutrigenetics. In fact, choline wasn't even recognized as a vitamin for many, many years. It's only been recognized recently, and that's only been made possible by advancing in genetics. Now that we understand some of the genetics that underlies choline biochemistry, we can use genetics to predict who needs to get choline in their diet and how much, and who needs no choline at all in their diet. 